Ever want to hear evangelism tips straight from God? That's what we're going to be talking about today from Genesis 24. And welcome to our study through the Bible. And um, if you want to join in and jump in through day one, there's going to be a link in the cards and the description down below where you can do just that. And so if you're new to the channel, go ahead and subscribe, and um, that will allow you to not miss any of our future videos studying through the Bible. And on that note, there is a big announcement affecting the direction and future of the channel, at least the study through the Bible portion, at the end of this video. So you're going to want to make sure and stay tuned so that you can hear that and not miss out on what we have to say for the future of this channel. And so let's go ahead and jump right in. Genesis 24, 5 through 8. Now, just setting this up, we are going into a, a section in which uh, the last time that we saw Isaac was on the mountain where uh, Abram was commanded to offer him as a sacrifice, and he gets up to the point where he's going to do it, and the angel of the Lord stops him dead in his tracks, and then he says, No, because you haven't withhold health your only son whom you love neither will I. And in this very place, I'm going to offer up my son as an offering for sin. And so Abram names the place Jehovah Jireh, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided, or in the mount of the Lord it will be seen. And we assume that Isaac comes back with Abram and the servants, but it doesn't mention him in the text. And the next time that we see him is actually going to be at the end of this chapter, Genesis 24. And so in the meantime, Sarah, his mom, had died. And so Abram says, I want to find a bride for Isaac. And so you have a father who then goes to his servant. Uh, and his name happens, we find out from earlier in Genesis, his name happens to be Eliezer, which means comforter. You have a father who is sending out his servant, the comforter, to go find a bride for his son, Isaac. Who? Uh, so if that sounds familiar, you have an idea of the direction in which we're going to go. And so uh, we're going to come back to that thought. And this chapter is very much one in which you could take it and you could glean a lot of tips for those of you who are single and you're looking for a future spouse uh, or maybe a current spouse, uh, somebody that you you're going to get married to and you want to know what God's will is for you in that. Lots of great principles when it comes to that and lots of great principles when it comes to this being a type and a shadow of things to come uh, but we're going to approach this today as if this servant is going out and he's doing exactly that he is finding those who are part of the bride for the son and uh, so we call that evangelism, or you call that sharing your faith, or making disciples, or whatever it is you call it. And so that is the task, that in the, the vantage point where we're going to look at this passage of Scripture. And there's lots and lots of great tips that are straight from God that will help you when you share your faith with others. So Genesis 24 verse 5 says, Peradventure, the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. If the woman will not be willing to follow you, then you shall be clear from this, uh, this oath. So the servant asks a very good question because he's basically being tasked with going to a foreign land, which happens to be that, you know, Abraham sends him, don't go to the Gentiles, don't go to the Canaanites, go back to the land of my family and find a bride for Isaac from there. And so this guy is going to a new place and he's going basically representing uh, his master and his son. Okay, the, the father and the son. And his job is to find a woman who would be a fitting bride for Isaac. And sight unseen, he doesn't even have a photo. He doesn't have anything. He just has a, what his word and what he says to them about Isaac and what he says to them about Abram. And he's going off into this land and finding a bride for his, uh, for his master son, Isaac. And so we ask a logical question, you know, what if the woman doesn't want to follow me back? What if I don't find anybody? 
And this is what we do. When God sends us out on the task, and Jesus sent us all out, he says, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them, and I'll be with you. And we immediately chime up and go, but wait, 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 wait. <laughs> what if, what if? And we ask a lot of different questions. And so one of ours is the same as this guy's. You know, what if they say no? What if they ask me a question that I don't know the answer to? And a lot of people, you know, they, they call that apologetics, the defense of the faith, and knowing your theology, knowing your the answers to questions and what the questions are that people are asking and studying to show yourself approved. All of that's important. Um, but sometimes we let that get in the way and the fear of not knowing everything or the potential, the answer to the potential question that might be asked, we use that to get us out of doing what God has asked us to do very clearly. And uh, then another question we ask is, what if they don't like me anymore? And, you know, you can call that persecution. That's what the Bible calls that. But, you know, in America, we don't really face, you know, like persecution, like they're going to imprison you, they're going to kill you, they're going to beat you. We, it's more like they're not going to like me anymore. And that could be family uh, that you don't want to lose that that family relationship with that could be friends that you don't want to lose that close relationship that could be people at your work that you don't want them to think that you're different or odd or that you it might affect your job in some cases um that could be anybody that you know god taps you on the shoulder he shows you they're in your relational world he calls you to pray for them and invite them and to share the gospel with them and you're looking at him and going like i don't want to what if what if what if and we're no long, we're no different than this uh, servant. So, moving on, verse seven, Abram's response was basically, "If she won't go, you're free from the oath." And what did Jesus say? Basically, the same thing that you know he sent out his apostles and he gave them authority to teach, heal, and cast out demons. And so they go out and they're doing exactly that. And he tells them, go to the house. If, there's, if they're worthy, stay there. If they're not worthy, wipe the dust off your feet and move on and go to the next step. He would say that, you know, you, you shouldn't cast your pearls before swine. And so we have this principle that it's not us that they're rejecting. He says very clearly, like, if they hate me, they'll hate you. You're just going as my representatives, as my messengers. Your job is to proclaim the message where I want you to, when I want you to, who I want you to. Uh, <clears throat> so now going on in verse 7, he says, He shall send his angel before you. And this is the comforting thing. And even in that case of when Jesus sent out his apostles, he says to them, Before you will not get through the cities of, of um, the towns where I'm sending you before the Son of Man comes. And so their job was to go you know, ahead and to prep the message for him. But in a very real way, you know, Jesus, he sends us out in the Great Commission. He says, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them. And lo, I will be with you even until the end of the age. And so he not only goes with us, but then here's the promise is that he actually goes before you. And this is, comes, gets down to the reality of what evangelism is. Evangelism isn't tr persuading somebody to your point of view. Evangelism is being used by, by God as a vessel to carry the message and it, it represent the character and the person and the identity of the king and, and the kingdom of God. And so we go, but in, in reality, a lot of the work has done, been done beforehand and it's going to be done after we're, we're there. And even during the fact, the point in which we're there, it's all God from start to finish. And so we need to realize that, that, you know, they're not just, they're not rejecting us when they reject us, our message. We're, they're rejecting God, the one who sent us. And he's the one who goes before us. He's the one who prepares their hearts. He's the one who prepares our hearts and gives us the word to say. He gives us the desire to do it, the motive to do it, the power to do it. And so uh, everything about evangelism from start to finish is completely an act of God. And when somebody actually accepts the gospel, it's always a miracle. 
And yes, you, it might involve answering some questions that they have. It might involve being tactical in your approach, and we're going to get to that in a second. And it definitely is going to involve a lot of prayer, which we're going to get to in a second. But from start to finish, it is a complete act of God. It's a miracle of God in which we're just simply being used as a vessel of God. God is going before you. And so then in verse 11, the servant goes to the land and uh, th this is his tactic. He says he went out at the time that women go out to draw water. So he's going out there to find a woman, a bride for Isaac. So what does he do? He goes where the women are going to be. And uh, <clears throat> particularly, he has a very specific type of woman that he has in mind. And so we're going to get to that in a second again. So go where they are. That's the first important tactic that I, I can share with you is that rather than sitting in your house, you know, playing video games, watching TV, that if you're going to make disciples, you need to go. You need to be physically going. And, you know, Jesus in the Great Commission, he just kind of assumes that. You know, that we make the English translation say, go is like the command. The command is make disciples and baptize and teach them. The, the assumption that Jesus is making is that you're going to go. You are going. As you go, having gone, that would be a more accurate translation of that. Um, so you can't reach anybody if you aren't out there where they are. And so think about thinking about who the people are that God has called you to reach and where are those people? Where where are they hanging out? Where where do they spend their time? Where do they spend their money? Where where are they? Go there and that's the opposite of like the if you build it, they will come approach. And a lot of times we fall into that as Christians and we think like, well, people who want to know, they're going to come to church. And uh, that's, you know, the approach that we take a lot of times. And a lot of times as pastors, we make the mistake of like making the, the whole of evangelism, we'll invite them to church. Well, church may or may not be the step that they are ready to take or that they need to take at that any given moment. We need to be obedient to what God wants us to do, and we need to go where they are. So that's the first tactic I can share with you. The second is this. Know who you are trying to reach. This servant knows exactly what he's looking for. He knows the type of woman and he knows where he's supposed to go to, to find her. And so he, and then what he's looking for to know who he's supposed to be you know, talking to. Know who you were trying to reach. What kind of terminology do they use? What kind of belief systems do they have? What kind of um, things are they interested in? What kind, of, uh, what kind of things do you think would reach them? What is God speaking to you about that? Tactic number three, listen before you speak. Instead of assuming that you know what somebody believes, especially if they come from a different worldview and you like you know that, say, they're, they're Buddhist or Mormon or uh, whatever, then instead of just saying, oh, well, I know what that, that group believes, instead of assuming that, talk to the person and ask them. You know, hey, I was curious, what do you think about this? Or I've heard that you were Buddhist. What does that mean to you? Like, what, what is it exactly that you believe? And once you've listened to them, one, you've already shown them, hey, I'm interested in you as a person, and I'm interested particularly in hearing your vantage point on this. And that gives you a lot of times an open door to be able to, to say, hey, would you mind if I share with you what I believe? Um, and then the other thing that it accomplishes is that now you know exactly what that person believes, not just what stereotypical Buddhists believe or whatever they might be. Then you are able to speak into that person's situation and the, the reasons why they are a part of that group or the reasons why they think that way or the reasons why they are more prone to believe in that certain way. 
you can address those issues. Uh, fourth tactic I would say is ask more than preach. And this goes along with what I was just saying. But sometimes when we think of sharing our faith, we think of just like, I'm going to get up on a street corner or I'm going to get up on a set of stairs or on a park bench and I'm going to start shouting and I'm going to do open air preaching. And there's some that God calls to do that and they do it really well and God blesses their ministry. Most of us, not so much. I've done it before. Not so much my thing. Um, but, you know, talking one-on-one -on -one with people, that's a different story. And especially somebody that I already have a relationship with. You know, I've done a lot of, you know, just cold, you know, like evangelizing to strangers. And there's a way that you can do that well and not so well. And, you know, again, you know, I, I enjoy doing it. And I think it's, pretty, you know, something that we should be doing. But at the same time, it's intimidating. You know, and it's hard and you don't get the same kind of responses when you do a re relational evangelism. But evangelizing is not just talking. In fact, I would say it's more listening than it is talking. Uh, the best way to get somebody to understand where you're coming from is to actually get them to articulate things out loud to get them to actually think for themselves about the questions that need they need to be asking and maybe they're not asking those yet but if you just put the thought in their head and then you ask them you know what do you think about that or you share a verse with them and you say hey what do you think that means then you are getting them to think through and process what is going on there and what you're wanting them to see and that's way more productive than just telling them oh this is what this verse means and um, this is what you should believe and this is what you should do with that because uh, chances are they're not paying attention on the same level if you're just telling them something especially if it's something they don't necessarily think that they need or they they don't really want to hear um, then you're going to be more productive if you ask them questions and get them to talk. Um, then the fifth tactic and the last one I'll share with you is get to the gospel immediately, ASAP. Um, and th that this just goes on to something we're going to talk a little bit more later is that there's a lot of topics that you can address. And there's cultural issues, there's political issues, there's, you know, religious issues. And so things pertaining if they like say that person is a Buddhist and lots of things that topics within that that you can address. Um, and sometimes we get really caught up and just talking about a lot of things that have to do with very little and we never actually get to the gospel and so we might even convince somebody that they're wrong or that we're right in a particular issue but if that hasn't introduced them to Jesus or it's just caused them to maybe leave the church or the religion that they're affiliated with but we haven't replaced that with Jesus we haven't done any favors to them and so I uh, get to the gospel as soon as you possibly can Whatever it is that you're talking about, and if it's spiritually related, just kind of make a beeline for the gospel. And that's the most productive use out of your time, out of their time, and out of the, the conversation. And so, tactics. This guy, he has good tactics. He goes where the women are going to be. And then his next tactic uh, is really interesting, uh, is that he hands it over to God. He's been given the task by Abraham. He's been sworn to an oath. But then he goes to where, the, where his audience is. And then he prays before, during, and after. This guy is really, he's on it. He knows exactly what he's supposed to be doing. And he's on it. And so in 24, 12, it says, O Lord God and my master Abraham, I pray you, send me good speed this day. And show kindness unto my master Abraham. And then later on, you know, blessed be the Lord God and my master Abraham. Okay, and so then you see him after the fact, he's praying, he's thanking God, you know, thank you for leading me to this and providing for me and answering my prayers. Okay, so this is an important thing about evangelism and about sharing your faith is pray before, during, after, pray, pray, pray. And um, that's very, very important that we do that. And uh, so 
But this goes along with what we were talking about before. God is going before you. And acknowledging that, acknowledging that God, this whole thing, this whole act of sharing your faith is completely from start to finish a work of God. So what kind of things can you be praying for? On a daily basis, whether you have an interaction with that person or not, whether that interaction was spiritual or not, here are some things that you can be praying for every single day. You can pray that God would soften their hearts. You can pray that they would have no peace until they rest in Him. You can pray that they would start to be asking questions. You can pray that God would grant them faith and repentance. You can be praying on your end that God would give you an opportunity and an open door. You can be praying for your heart and God to be shaping your character. You can be praying for God to be giving you insight and understanding into his words. So when you have the opportunity that you're ready with answers, you can be praying that um, God would give you the words to say when he gives you that opportunity. So those are the types of things that you can be praying for. And the scripture is littered with these things. And just asking God to do the things that only God can do. And that, that um, is what we can do. Okay, so 2433, don't be derailed. I will not eat until they've told my errand, he said, speak on. So, you know, Rebecca, she's interested in, in the offer. So back, back up. Okay. Uh, so the servant, after he prays, he prays specifically, hey, God, let the woman be the one who, when she uh, is there and I ask for a drink of water, that she gives my animals uh, water to drink as well. And what he's doing is he's basically pinpointing the, the type of women who are um, aware, they're, they're selfless, that they're servants. Um, and so that way uh, he can narrow it down into the type of woman that he's looking for, for his, his, his master's son. And so right after he gets done praying with that, then he's waiting. And then this woman, Rebecca, comes. And Rebecca seems pretty attractive, seems like the type of girl that Isaac would, you know, be interested in. And so he goes and he uh, asks her for a drink of water. And so she says, after he, he drinks, then she says, oh, let me get water for your animals. Exactly like you prayed for. So he's like, okay, God, I'm assuming now that I put this in your hands, and uh, you've answered me. I, I'm assuming that this must be the one that you want for Isaac. And so I'm going to put the offer out there. And so she, he puts the offer out there and he gives her some preliminary gifts. And then uh, she seems interested. And so she takes him back to her father's house. And especially she seems very excited when she finds out Isaac is a, a relative, you know. Uh, you know, Abram's from this th these parts and... Um, so that seems to get her excited, and then she goes back, she tells her family, and they get excited, and they're thinking, you know, like, hey, sit down with us, eat with us, you know, let us take care of you, let's have a good time together, and he says, no, you know, like, I'm not going to eat with you, that can come later, that's fine, I, I don't have, I'm not rushed, I'm not, I don't have to get out the door, but we can do that, but before we do that, let me get on to what I, why I'm here, why I was sent. And so he goes in, he gets their attention, and then he speaks. And he gives the message, and he doesn't allow himself to get derailed from the mission in which he was sent. And so it's easy for us to get derailed. And one way is through rabbit trails, like I talked about, talking about a lot of to topics that relate to the topic, but they don't really get to the heart of the gospel. They don't get to about talking about Jesus. They don't ta get talking about how do you actually accept this offer of forgiveness, Um and so we just go on these rabbit trails and we get derailed that way. Or uh, maybe we get derailed by something fun comes up and, you know, the person that we're supposed to be ministering to, you're like, hey, let's go out to eat. Oh, okay, let's go. Just like this kind of situation. And so we get derailed that way by distractions. And then the, the other way is through an inward focus. Um, and that's where we just become so 
um, fixated on our own needs as an individual or we get so fixated on our own needs as a church that we just lose complete sight of the fact of the mission that we're supposed to go out and make disciples of all nations. And so we get derailed into just focusing on, you know, well, we got to improve the finances or we got to improve attendance or we got to improve this or that and that program and that building and that, all these kind of things. And not realizing that in reality, the answer to all those questions is being outward focused. Because if you're focused on the mission, then you're going to be doing things that are naturally going to be attractive to people. You're going to be providing services. You're going to be providing venues. Uh, you're going to be providing a quality uh, that you're, you have those people in mind. And you're going to eliminate a lot of the distractions and the in, you know, in talking and you know, um, backbiting and gossip and all the things that you, if you're thinking about what – people who are not believers might think if they come to my church or things of that nature, then you're going to be thinking about uh, fixing things and changing things into a way that would take away a lot of those um, those stumbling blocks. And so you get those out of the way, and so then you're more ready when the people come. They're more likely to come because you're doing things that are attracting them, and you're out there inviting them, and you're out there sharing the gospel with them. And so then they come, and then the more people who come, well, that naturally takes care of things like attendance and finances, which we can then pay for buildings, and then we can put programs on, uh, and, and we can be more focused out in the community because now more people are here. So we often are our own worst enemy when it comes to that. We focus on ourselves, and I got to get mine. I got to get my needs met. And we do that personally. We do that collectively as organizations and as churches. And that's a way in which we can get derailed from the task that Jesus has given us of making disciples. And so Genesis twenty four fifty three. We've you know, skipped quite a bit of ground, but. Um, so the whole conversation goes forth. You know, the parent and the brother, they're like, okay, we're, we're on board. You got to ask Rebecca, and we're going to get to that in a second. But then um, he comes bearing gifts. You know, he, he comes, you know, before he, he came prepared. And he had, you know, bracelets and jewelry and money and all this kind of stuff. And he comes prepared. And that's exactly how God does. You know, the, on a uh, basic level, you know, Jesus said that, you know, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Uh, and so God's grace and his preservation of life and the gift of creation that he's given us and uh, the gifts that he, he gives to everybody and the way that he takes care of people generally is, you know, common grace. And then you have specific grace in which he gives the gift of, you know, repentance and faith and yeah, conviction of sins and of judgment of righteousness to the unbeliever. And he he works miracles in their life and around their life. And he he gives he points them and he raises questions in their mind and he he draws them to himself. And that that is grace that even before a person believes, then God is extending that to them. And then after they have accepted the, the gospel message and they've accepted the, 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 the offer of eternal life and forgiveness of sins, then he not only gives them that, but then he gives them the Holy Spirit and he gives them spiritual gifts and he gives he says we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, that we've been given everything pertaining to life and godliness. We've made, been made partakers of the divine nature in Christ Jesus. And so all of those things are things that God gives, and he's constantly giving before we're saved, after we're saved, and onward. He is constantly giving, and we can never outgive God. And um, so so in Genesis 24, 53, that's what we see. And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebecca. He gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. And so let's keep in mind, you know, the picture here, you know, a servant is sent out, uh, an unnamed servant who happens to have a name that we were told earlier, uh, it means comforter. He's sent out and he's uh, to find a bride for the father's son. And 
then he comes, you know, bearing the message, bearing gifts, and then sight unseen, the opportunity goes to Rebecca, who uh, is a type of the bride of Christ. And so she goes out and um, she has the opportunity to accept or reject him. And she does accept him. She does accept him. And uh, so in Genesis 24, 64, it says when she saw Isaac, she lit, lit off the camel, right? She jumped off the camel. She, she sees Isaac, who is a type in the picture of Jesus, and she goes running to him. And so the whole... The whole message, the whole time, the servant, he's just talking up Jesus. He's lifting up Jesus. Oh, you don't know how great my master is. This is all these things I can tell you. Here's how he looks. Here's how what he does. Here's how, you know, let me talk to you. Have I mentioned Isaac? Have I talked to you about Isaac? You know, he's lifting up Jesus as high as possible. And that's our that's our task when we're sharing the faith with others is to lift Jesus up as high as we possibly can. And Jesus said this. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. So our job is to lift Jesus up as high as possible. And that's the reason why as soon as you possibly can, get to the gospel, get to the good news, get to Jesus and introduce Jesus to them. Because Jesus is the most attractive thing that you could possibly offer them. Okay, showing them why they're wrong or you know why their church is wrong or why their scriptures are wrong or whatever it is or you know why their particular worldview is wrong, that only goes so far. But showing them Jesus is the most attractive and most effective thing that you can do. And Jesus says, lift me up and I'll draw all the men to myself. But then ultimately, the ball's in their court. And uh, so they looked at uh, Rebecca, Genesis 24, 58. Will you go with this man? She said, I will go. And so the ball is in their court. You, you've, all you can do at the end of the day is you can do what God is leading you to do. So if that's invite them to church, invite them to church. If that's share the gospel with them, share the gospel with them. If that's give them a Bible, give them a, a Christian book, um, have you know just share some kind of insight, maybe not even saying where it came from, um, into their situation and their life, whatever God's calling you to do. And even if that's just praying every day for them or looking for those opportunities, then that's all you can do. And at the end of the day, the ball's in their court. In spite of all the gifts, in spite of uh, all the things that he's told her about Isaac, in spite of all the um, the, the, the good news and the, the offer that he's made, the ball was in Rebecca's court. And so, uh, or the, the ball was in Re Rachel's, wait, no. Rebecca's, <laughs> I'm forgetting because we're doing a study through the Bible and I'm, I'm in one section over here, then I'm going back to another section over here. Uh, I'm forgetting where we are. Anyway, Rebecca, the ball was in Rebecca's court. And um, so that's all we can do. Put the ball in their court. Put a rock in their shoe. Put a, you know, way down the shelf. You know, so, you know, there's one more item up there. Sow a seed, plant it, and uh, water it. And um, pray over it and put the ball in their court. Do what God calls you to do. And at the end of the day, that's all you can do. What if she doesn't refuse or what she doesn't want to come back? Well, then you're free from the oath, right? And so Jennifer 24, 60, Genesis 2467, she came, became his wife and he loved her. And so this is where um, the whole mystery is really unveiled. Um, because this whole thing, Genesis 22 through 24, uh, even going back further than that, you know, Isaac, how was he born? He was a miracle child. 
uh, born to parents that shouldn't have been able to bear a child and he's a child of promise and so then he's born of laughter and then he comes in and as he's grown then you know he's Abram's commanded to take your only son whom you love Isaac and offer him and on the place where I'm going to show you and so it's three days journey and Abram rec he reckons him as dead from the moment the command came but believing that God was able to raise seed even from a dead man if he was able to or able to raise the dead and the person of Isaac and so they go three days journey and Abraham or Isaac asked him you know where's the the wood or where's the offering and he says God will provide himself an offering for sin and so they go up to the top of the mountain and Abram's about to do that and they go in agreement and Isaac's bound on the altar and then the angel of the Lord says stop because you've been willing to do this I will offer up my only son and I'm going to do it in this very place and he's going to be an offering for sin and so Abraham names the place in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen and so then we assume that Isaac come back, comes back down the mountain with Abram and the, the servants. And he doesn't come back. Down, it doesn't say it in the text. We assume that he does. And we have every reason to believe that because he's back home in Genesis 24 when we find this out. But the next time that you see Isaac in the, the text is when he is united with his bride, Rebekah. And that this whole journey is that in the meantime, Abram, he goes to his eldest, eldest servant, who is unnamed in this text, but his name means comforter, Eliezer. And he sends this servant to go to, to the land of his people and to, and to find a suitable bride for Isaac. And so he comes, he goes and he's bearing gifts and he bears the message and he, he's speaks with conviction and lifts lifts the son up and then rebecca who sight unseen is received the gifts and heard the the message and she's received it she then responds and she affirms and then she is taken to go and be with Isaac. The bride has now come to, to be home with Isaac and they're united as husband and wife. And have you ever heard this story before? Behold, I speak of Christ in the church. You see, marriage, ultimately marriage, is about a picture Another picture that God is painting uh, that's supposed to represent the relationship between Jesus and the church. And it's also the husband and the wife, the two shall become one flesh in the same way that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, separate personages, are one God. That in that way, that is a picture of Jesus and his church, and it's a picture of of the Trinity and the relationship that God has even within himself. And so uh, that is a convicting, uh, a convicting and challenging task that we've been given. And then we also saw the, the parallels between the message in which we are called to go and to, to preach. And we go out there and we do what God has called us to do and we're faithful to that and allow him to sort out who is a part of his bride and who is not. And so uh, that's uh, the message for today. And so if you want to join up with us in our study through the Bible, we do. Um, we are making some changes, and this is a good place to talk about that announcement that I mentioned. We are making two major changes uh, to this portion, the study through the Bible portion of this channel. The first is we've, we're going from daily assignments being sent out to you to weekly assignments. And so we're going to eliminate the daily videos that we've been doing and just do the weekly summary. So uh, the, the assignments for next week are going to be attached to this video. And um, so they're going to be in the description down below. 
And so we're going to have the weekly video and we're going to have the Q&A video. The second announcement, the second major change is that we're actually moving this entire portion of this channel onto another channel that's already live and already created called Study Through the Bible. And um, YouTube gets really specific. And if we want other people that want to know how to study the Bible to be able to find this more effectively, then that's the way to do it, is to, to make things as specific on YouTube as to this is what we do. And I found that uh, it was creating tension both ways. The people who are into my cults videos weren't so much into the study through the Bible videos, and the people who came for because of the study through the Bibles weren't so into my cult videos. And so it was creating this um, tension to where the only time that YouTube was letting people know and promoting the videos was with the people who like were into both. And so people would subscribe, but then they wouldn't ever find our videos again. And so it's two separate channels, one for cults and one for the Bible stuff. And we're just going to do it that way. And so if you have any questions about how to find that, I'm going to put that in the end screen. I'm going to put it in the cards and I'm going to put it in the description down below for this video, a link to that other channel. And then you would be able, the only videos that are going to be on there are going to be videos pertaining to the Bible. So the study through the Bible stuff, uh, previous archive messages uh, that I've given in the past, as well as um, the weekly and the Q&A um, videos as well, moving on into the future. And so if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to the channel and give us a thumbs up on this video. If you like today's content, share this video with others in your life who want to study the Bible. Give them the resources they need and uh, the answers to the questions that they have. Let's do it in community here on YouTube. And until next time, may God's grace be with you.